I'm Bill Drake, president of Friends of Sierra Rock Art. We were formed in 1990 to help protect the ancient petroglyph sites in the Northern Sierra region. For the past 30 years, we've worked closely with the Tahoe National Forest, as well as with other entities. Today's program will give you a good sense of the rock art in our region, also who made them and how we work to protect them. You can find some further resources on our website, sierrarockart.com, and also we'll give you some resources at the end of the presentation. I'm Nolan Smith. I'm a retired district archaeologist from the Tahoe National Forest. I worked there for 40 years in managing the many cultural resources. Uh, I worked with uh, Friends of Sierra Rock Art since the mid-90s, and it's been a wonderful working relationship. We've managed to protect many sites, monitor sites, as well as do inventory with Friends of Sierra Rock Art. They've been a big assist to the Tahoe National Forest over many years. This presentation is titled uh, Ancient Petroglyphs of California's Northern Sierra Nevada. Uh, the presentation is presented by Nolan Smith and Bill Drake. Uh, this presentation will discuss style seven rock art, uh, meanings, interpretation, and things like that. Um, who made the images? Uh, we'll show you examples of images and sites. We'll talk about site management and protection, possible interpretations of some images, and problems related to rock art interpretation. The Mars Archaeological Complex dates roughly 1500 to 4000 years BP. Uh, some of the major characteristics are atlatls and spears, basalt tools, grinding slicks, and hand milling stones. Uh, the Mars peoples were hunters and gatherers, and most archaeologists think that they're ancestors of the uh, Washoe. This image here shows uh, the different cultural groups in the area, and it has an overlay here of the uh, style seven rock art, and that's in these plus sign symbols right through here. And you can see it overlaps Truckee, Lake Tahoe, Grass Valley, Auburn, almost down to Placerville. And that was the approximate range of style seven petroglyphs in the Mars complex. Uh, this photograph here shows uh, an arrow, uh, feathered arrow at the base, as well as a, a shaft which you inserted in there, as well as the atlatl itself. On the atlatl on the left end, you can see a hook. On the bottom, you can see a uh, weight, atlatl weight, which is attached to the atlatl itself. And you can see here it's a handle to throw the atlatl. Here it is constructed together. You see the dart. Uh, it's put together. It's half, it's in the uh, atlatl ready to be thrown. And the next photograph is of a gentleman casting the atlatl and a young lady who has already cast hers. You can see how the atlatl flies. The use of the atlatl, it's an Aztec word. It uh, kind of means spear thrower or, or it assists in throwing the spear. It uh, can toss a spear much further and much harder and much more accurate than hand thrown spears. So it's a very util use useful implement that the uh, uh, Mars complex people had. Here are some uh, samples of basalt tools uh, from the Mars complex. Um, you can see points, uh, um, spear points, uh, dart points, things like that. This next one here is a uh, atlatl weight, which you saw earlier in the uh, earlier picture when it was half of the atlatl itself. This is how it look out in the, uh, on the ground, you might find it. And then these are drills. Um, thumb, uh, in this case, you can use your thumb on it and your forefinger, and you can use it to twist and turn and uh, create holes and things like that. Um, oftentimes, drills were uh, made from existing artifacts that got broken in the uh, process of manufacture or use and they work them down into a drill or another artifact. Local ethnographic background includes the Washoe, which are centered around Lake Tahoe, and they utilize both uh, sides of the Sierra Crest. Uh, the Nisinach of the Maidu inhabited the valley and foothill region on the western slopes of Sierra Nevada, and utilize the area east up to the Sierra Crest, and as you may as well uh, surmise that uh, the area in between was kind of a no man's land in, uh, in uh, Sierra Nevada's say around 5,000 foot elevation higher up. Uh, both, both groups utilize those areas. This photograph here shows Washoe territory, past and present. Uh, the green line shows the traditional nuclear territory of the Washoe. 
and the trifle and the blue line shows the trifle traditional peripheral territory. Uh, so it extends down into the valley and over to Pyramid Lake in terms of the peripheral area. Uh, the Washoe had, and had a huge area, but later on it was uh, kind of constricted when the uh, Nissinan came in. Here you can see a photograph or a picture of the Washoe, uh, excuse me, the Nissinan area. It shows Sierra, Nevada, Placer, El Dorado, and parts of uh, Sutter counties. It extended up to the, the ridge, the uh, Sierra Nevada crest. Okay, now we're going to look at some different petroglyph sites that are found on the El Dorado, Plumas, and Tahoe National Forest and the surrounding areas. For this first site, uh, the gentleman on the right is Hank Meals. He's a highly respected member of our area. He's an archaeologist, historian, and writer who's made a lot of contributions to our community. And in this photo, he's leading a group to one of the largest sites in the North Central Sierra. And looking at this, it's important to remember the landscape within which these sites exist. We tend to look at a site, whether it's archeologists or members of the public, we look at sites and look at images and tend to forget that they're part of a larger context, which relates to the environment around them and the overall landscape. We can think about the Navajo or Diné people in the Southwest, and for them and their environment, all the mountain peaks around them are part of their creation stories and other stories. And within them, they feel they live in a sacred landscape. So when they put their sites in that area, it's part of a whole sacred landscape. And we can imagine that other ancient people have perhaps some similar views. So it's important to keep in mind that when we think of rock art, we need to also remember that it's part of a larger picture. So this is a site that Hank is going to. This whole outcrop is covered with hundreds of petroglyphs. It happens to be made of magnetite rock, so it's magnetic. And Hank Mills uh, told me on one occasion that he was talking to someone who had spent a lot of time in that area and from across the canyon had had observed during a thunderstorm that lightning hits this rock repeatedly. And that's something that certainly would have been significant to the native people that spent time here. Here's one of many images, uh, some very unusual images. Some uh, we can never know what really they're meant to represent. And again, we're taking an image here and it's taken a little bit out of context. So it's good to keep that in mind because it has a context of the images around it. If they're all one grouping, we call that a panel of rock art. In this case, we have this whole site. So we have to remember this is part of a context that we're uh, considering here. Another image of the site sort of looks like two duck's heads, but we can't know what that is. This is one of my favorite images of the site. I found this very intriguing, very unusual image. And here we have a bighorn sheep, and bighorn sheep were in the area of the High Sierras for the ancient people. And this is not a Martis image. Most of the sites you'll be seeing today were made by the Martis complex, the ancestors of the Washoe. This particular image is not Martis, and the site, while some images are from the Martis people, there were other tribes, that, other groups that also visited the area and made some of the rock art. That last site was in Sierra County, and now we're moving to Nevada County. Again, we have a site at higher elevation with nice views. In this picture, we can notice the water in the background, so this would be a good place for occupation. We have petroglyphs in the foreground. Here's a close-up of that panel of petroglyphs. Typically, you've got abstract art. The majority of petroglyphs that the Martyrs people made were abstract and geometric in nature. A smaller percent was what we call representational, which means you can identify some object out of it, a bear paw or deer track, something of that nature. Uh, this particular uh, panel, it's 
a little intriguing with what looks like a face on the right side. We don't know what that means, of course, and we don't generally think of rock art as doodling. We feel that it, in general, has some kind of meaning to the people that made it. Here's another small panel of abstract images. And when we think of rock art, it's important to think of, to remember that the people that made this art had a particular worldview that this is an expression of, even though we can't know what that was. So with the Martyrs people, their rock art tended to be on gently sloping granite surfaces. They generally made, uh, for the most part, abstract art, infrequently made images of human beings or what we call anthropomorphs. And when they did, they were generally like stick figures. And they also had sites that from which you could usually see particular mountain peaks. So this was a part of what came into their cultural expression. And you could think of that as very different than some rock art in the Southwest, for example, where you have a lot of rock art on vertical surfaces, a lot of well-formed human figures, animal figures, and so on. So, so this is an expression of a particular view of the world. Even though we can't understand that, we can at least appreciate that. And here, of course, uh, we do have an image that strongly suggests a rattlesnake. And we have to remember that rattlesnakes and bears were uh, major parts of the experience of ancient people. And here we have uh, one of many types of images that represent a bear print. Uh, this could be two bear paws put together, or maybe it's the grandmother of all bears. It's hard to say, but this is one expression of, to represent the bear. Another image here, abstract image, could represent the sun or something else. And here we have a human figure, which again is not real common. And again, is sort of like a stick figure. Now, one problem we have at these sites and the reason we keep them confidential is the fact that people come in and feel that it's real cool to make their own images. And so we have someone who came in and did this graffiti at the site and therefore diminished it. Here's another picture uh, of an unusual set of images on a vertical surface. And this is at the same site, but you can see this graffiti, which was probably made a few days ago, a few decades ago, uh, the 1910 data is probably a fake. And it's right on top of, right next to rock art that goes back 1,500, 4,000 years, back to the potentially the time of the pyramids. And here someone's come in and done an act of destruction. Moving to another site, also in Nevada County, we have rock art on this outcrop here. In this picture, the person on the left is Bill Slater, who worked with FSRA for 30 years as one of the district archaeologists of the Tahoe National Forest. And you can see you've got a great view. The site, like many of them, has a great view, and you can see other mountains from the site. This particular site has a number of uh, very interesting bear paw images. You can also notice that there's a lot of lichen, which is growing on the site. You can see those black and gray splotches that are liking this. These pictures were taken in the early 90s, and the rock art has, uh, the lichen has increased noticeably since that time. And gradually, a lot of these images and you know, a number of sites are going to disappear. You know, at this point, we don't feel it's something we are able to mitigate. So it's just an act of nature. But it's sad uh, to see the impact on the rock art. Here's another Im uh, set of images of the site uh, that are a little more abstract. <clears throat> and we're still in Nevada County here. This is uh, an outcrop in the middle of a, a meadow. And it's unique for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the fact that it has <clears throat> bedrock mortars, or BRMs, which were mortars used for grinding acorn, processing acorn. And this site is likely uh, a Nisinan site. 
It's um, not likely to be MARTIS. The MARTIS people aren't thought of to particularly have had the ACORN technology for the most part, uh, possibly during the uh, transition near the end of their time period. Uh, some artists, but some archaeologists think they might have had it more than than we think. But um, in general, this is more of a later culture, like the Nisinan people. And of course, you have oak trees uh, right next to the uh, bedrock mortars in this case. And the Nisinan people that you know we refer to them as Southern Maidu. Uh, mentioned that earlier, and that's a uh, anthropological. Mm -hmm. Description the Nisinan themselves don't consider themselves Maidu. They use simply the word Nisinan. The other important feature at this site is what we call cupules. And these are very interesting and they're pretty unusual within in our region. And they're very small cups that are made in rock, uh, often on sloping surfaces. They were not used for grinding acorn or herbs or anything like that. And we believe they had a, a ritual purpose. Eth eth in ethnography, there are indications that cupule sites could be used for rainmaking magic or possibly puberty ceremonies. And given that these cupules are right next to the grinding rocks, it would suggest that this is a women's site because the, the women's task was the grinding of the acorns. So this could have been a ritual ceremony for for women to use. As an example, the size of the cupules compared to a quarter. And now we're moving to Placer County. And this is a, another very large site. There's a lot of rocker images on this outcrop. And the people in the group are being very careful to try not to walk on the images. That's a challenge when you have rock art sites on gently sloping surfaces but hard sole shoes can wear down the edges of uh, petroglyphs. We also don't do rubbings where you put a sheet of paper over an image and use something like graphite to outline the image. Uh, that can also over time wear down the edges of images. We don't put anything in images like chalk for chalking or anything else that might hinder possible dating techniques or in any way disturb a site. This is, brings out an interesting feature here with these images. When you look at the bear paw image on the right, this is a case where you have another rock that's what we call an intrusion that's broken through the surface of the outer layer of rock. And in this case, you have that shape, which the Martis people then used to create the design of a bear paw. And we have a number of examples of, of that, how they used a natural feature to create images. A couple of examples of bear paw images at this site. And then in this particular picture, you'll see a lizard right here. So this is one of the images at the site that we would call representational, that you can identify a feature with. And then here you have where someone came into the site and made this image of an owl because they thought that'd be cool to do. So you have an example of site destruction. And graffiti can be a little tricky because in this case, for example, we have this, this image, which was from 1888, not 1988 made by Hattie Sproul, part of the Sproul family that's related to Sproul Hall at UC Berkeley. So it's uh, you know a prominent family that visited this area. And it's historic graffiti, but you know any graffiti is gonna degrade the site. Management. <clears throat> Management is, uh, consists of surveying inventory, site recording, photography, mapping and sketching, monitoring and documenting effects to sites, as well as report findings to the agency. This here is on the photograph on the trail, I'm going to, to do some survey work to uh, locate petroglyph sites. This is an archeologist here, and she's going over to a petroglyph site right now in Picking Valley, uh, part of the survey. 
And the search for, a, uh, search for petroglyphs was uh, never ending and we would go almost anywhere to find petroglyphs. And because uh, we wanted to be completely thorough with where we were going to locate and find all the petroglyph sites we possibly can. And this is the first crew that I worked with, uh, inventory of the Middle Fork and Picayune Valley in 1997. Um, this is a creek here which flows down into the North Fork of the American River, Middle Fork of the American River. Um, this is an image of a circle with the radiating lines going out from it, possibly a sun, something like that. Uh, this image here shows peck marks, and you can see how deep they are. Individual peck marks, you can pick them all out. You go back to the other one over here, and it looks like they're smoothed out. So what happened was they usually peck first, and then they smooth it over with abrasion. Uh, it's very common, but you'll see both types, you know, of petroglyphs there, all encapsulated, encapsulated under the style seven petroglyph. Here we see a bear paw on the right, and you see a circle here with radiating lines, concentric rings, and a bear paw all together. Um, we don't know what that means, but perhaps there is some type of interpretation or explanation for what it might have meant at one point in time. In this photograph here, you'll see uh, like an arrow shaft. You can see the feathers coming out, and you can see going through it uh, part of the shaft. You can also see around it other uh, petroglyph elements. Uh, why these, these could have been made at a different point in time. You may have had one done first, another one. Somebody else could have added on at a different time to create what you're seeing today. Again, this case, we're using uh, the uh, rock art, the rock itself, and then how it was formed, the layeration here. And you can see how they utilize these uh, thin white lines of sediment. And here they use crosses. And down beyond that point, they use straight lines. Why they did cross in one place and only straight lines in another, we don't really know. We don't understand why they did this. Uh, maybe sometime we'll figure this out, but uh, doubtful. Again, they're using the lines right through here. And in this one picture here, you can see this line going up to here, part of the rock formation. And then here you see more cross lines going inside, keeping inside of that. Above it, you see these wiggly lines. Again, abstract forms. So this site is in Placer County, and it's an important site for our group because it was related to our founding. It's got one of the most spectacular views of any site that I can imagine. It's at about 6,500 feet elevation with the wild and scenic American River 3,000 feet below. The site itself is this outcrop next to the shovel. So the shovel gives you an idea of the size of it. And I used to come visit this site in the late 1980s. And then and around 1989, I came to learn that the site had been uh, vandalized, that some pieces had been stolen from it, the rocks very fractured. Uh, and uh, around 1989, there was a work crew that came out and cemented the rock together to try to preserve it and also prevent further theft. But because of the realization that some of this rock had been stolen, the site that is really a very special place, uh, some of us came together and created Friends of Sarah Rockart to help protect places like this. This is a drawing of that panel of rock art. And this is by John Betts, who's an artist and archaeologist. And he's given me permission to use his drawing as long as I give him credit for it when I do educational presentations. You can look at the images here and see a lot of abstract images. You can see some bear paws, some other animal prints. Um, you can see what looks like a sun design over here. Uh, some very unusual images. In general, with these sites, they have some commonalities. I mean, they were part of the same style, style seven rock art, we call it, uh, that were made by the Martyrs people. You have a lot of bear paws are common, things like that, a lot of abstract images. But sites, a number of them also can be unique and have some unique features. So this is a, a little close up of the central portion of that panel. You can see different bear paw images 
over here and over here on the upper left. Uh, the central design is very unusual. And the images at the site are a little deeper than, than some at other sites too, which is in, intriguing. This is a photograph of that actual part of the panel. Uh, this was taken in the early 1990s. If you look, you can see some dark splotches from lichen that's growing at this site. Uh, since that time, it's uh, advanced somewhat. Uh, here we have a couple of bear paw images, some other tracks up here. You can see the cement where the rocks were cemented together. A sun-like design. Also, you can see lichen in this picture from some of the little gray blotches that have increased over the past 25 years. And with this site, uh, it was owned by private landowners over, over time, and we always had a dream of getting it into the Tahoe National Forest, uh, so it could have some degree of protection, even though some of the landowners were, were good about the site. And in the mid 90s, I took several people up to the site, including some land managers for the Tahoe National Forest, in hopes of somehow working to get this site into the hands of the Forest Service. Fortunately, in 1997, it became the, became the opportunity for the Forest Service to do a major land trade with uh, private landowners. And from their remembering about this site, they made sure that the site was thrown in part of the mix. So uh, at that point, it became part of the Tahoe National Forest. And the, around 1989, Dan Foster, who was a state archeologist for what now is Cal Fire, had this barrier put in at the site because in the, at that time you could drive all the way out to the site itself. So this prevented any cars or vehicles from going out to the site to try to help give it a little more protection. And these are some of the measures that have been done to protect the site. The Forest Service put in this little rock wall here because foot traffic going out to the site could easily inadvertently just walk right over the petroglyphs. So this was to very subtly, very gently direct foot traffic around the petroglyph panel to prevent any sort of damage to it. Friends of Sarah Rockhart goes out there and shores this up uh, after the winter snows and makes sure it's in good shape. The Forest Service also put in this ammo can and within that there's a notepad for people to write their thoughts and feelings about being at a special place. Also some information on site etiquette. Uh, and so these are ways to encourage people to care for these places and to protect them and to not do thoughtless graffiti or things like that. It's a very tricky thing to do these kind of measures. Uh, sometimes you can put up a big sign to try to prevent destruction and that just makes people mad and uh, they shoot holes in, the, holes in the sign and trash the site. So it's, it, it's very hard to know how people respond to different things, but this is a, a general approach which seems to have been positive because there has been some scratching at the site and degrees of vandalism. This is a, of course, historic Donner Summit. And there's a very important site right near the summit. As you can see from this view, you can see Donner Lake and the bridge, as well as the overlook area. <clears throat> this is from the Donner Lake site. You can see the site uh, spread out through the whole area. It's difficult to see where it's at. I'll try and use a pointer to kind of give an outline of how big the site actually is. It's a pretty good sized site and it's very, has a lot of intricate detail. Here is an interpretive sign developed by the Forest Service and um, Friends of Sierra Rock Art and, Tahoe Nash and the Sierra Nevada Alliance and the Washoe Tribe of California. As you can see on the interpretive sign, we're showing some of the detail out there as well as providing some information about why we preserve it, why it's fragile, why it's irreplaceable, some instructions for the local public. We encourage the public to come look at these things because it hopefully will provide them with a sense of ownership. So I want to protect these things and maintain them. Um, this is a glyph from that same site. You can see it's a bear paw um, right through here, through here, down through here. You can see the piece come across. 
So you can see in this site or this image that uh, you know it's a very good clear image of a bear paw. We have many of these scattered throughout uh, Style 7 petroglyph area. Uh, this place here, you can see this is an inclusion in the rock, and you can utilize, you see how they utilize the rock to make these lines. Um, this here is more is pretty abstract. You can see there's a circle here, one inside, and then something coming off the top with radiating lines going out, uh, V-shaped lines going up, tying into an outer piece, a line going down the middle. You know what this may mean? Who knows? It could be some uh, shaman's uh, vision quest. You saw something in his vision quest after potentially dehiding himself for three or four days, and uh, that's what he saw. Uh, we also document the sites. Uh, this is a copy of the Donner Pass Petroglyph site record. It's the front page by John Betts. Uh, this here is a site sketch map, and you can see it has all sites of information on it. Uh, it shows the datum, the site boundary, site boundary through here. It shows where a number of the panels are, and through here, uh, it shows you where the roads are at, um, pipeline, utility line all sorts of stuff, anything that's appropriate to the site that might be in or adjacent to the site. So somebody who's coming back to the site can find it and check these things out. Um, this site, this image here is of a uh, feature sketch. It shows just one panel. Um, you can see it says uh, Petrica panel 22. Um, so you can see there's a whole bunch of panels just by the number there. And you can see the detail that John has sketched on there in terms of the Petrica, so you can see um, ravey lines and circles, concentric rings, um, all sorts of things in through there. This is our Friends of Sierra Rock Art Monitoring Forum. Uh, we utilize this to document what we do out in the woods. Uh, we have the site number, the name, the date, uh, the archaeologists, the monitors, the hours, the general location, uh, documents things, the datum, reference points. They check all these things off based on the site survey record. When they're out there, the monitors do. Uh, they discuss disturbances and any recommendations to the site, like uh, creating a big uh, log jam or something like this to prevent people from driving down a road to the site. Um, they also continuation part of it there, and conditional things such as maps, sketches, and photographs you can add. So, and also down below, you have emergency numbers of people to contact. Uh, so, anyway, Sierra, uh, Francis Sierra Rock Art utilizes this form to document what we find out there and manage the sites. So now we're moving to El Dorado County. And this particular site is near a ridge top. It's an amazing place. And one thing that's phenomenal here is you can see for miles from the site. And that while there has been uh, sheep grading historically over time, so the landscape's been modified a little bit, but for the most part, you can stand at this site and see what people saw a thousand years ago. We used to visit this site in the early 1990s and became aware of a plan to develop this site. It's on private land. And there was there were proposals for either a golf course or a housing project. So we decided to get involved to make sure this site would be protected. And around 1993 or 94, I took the lead of the local Indian Council out there and we agreed to work together to try to protect the site and to work to develop a proposal that would be agreeable to the native community and the county and the landowner. So we spent a lot of time on working on that in the mid 90s. This is one of the rocks at the site that has petroglyphs, there are 28 of these rocks that we each one is a distinct unit. So it's like a panel. So there, we say there are 28 panels of rock art. And this rock happens to be andesite. And there also is a quarry of andesite very close by where the ancient people would you know, work in the quarry to uh, get rocks to use for tool making. And this site, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, I would say, in my opinion, at least a thousand years or so. It's a you know, very, very old site. So here's another one of the rocks or images at the site. Another image. 
And one thing that's very interesting about this site, in 1996, Sue Merritt wrote her master's thesis, a 300 page master's thesis about this site that she had studied for, for years. And she came to recognize that it is a very significant celestial observatory. And I'll read from her master's thesis. It tracks the solstices, equinox, four 28-day cycles for each solstice and midpoint between the solstices and equinox. So this is a, a very profound and significant place. Now, these pictures were taken in 1993 and 1994. Unfortunately, not too long after I took these pictures, this rock here with its images was stolen from the site. And that's the absolute worst thing that could have happened. So you've got this incredibly profound site that's very meaningful. And someone comes in and steals a piece of it and takes it away. And it's, you know, the site is diminished forever. And that's something that it's hard to avoid with sites that are remote. We do monitor sites a lot to, and, and do some things like we were showing you at the site over the American River to try to encourage protection of sites. But some things we're not able to stop and it, it's very tragic. Interpretation, what does it all mean? Uh, it's, we don't really know exactly what everything means. Uh, we can just interpret a few of the details that we see. And here there's an anthropomorph right here. And here's a bear paw. And when we look at this, this is an interesting picture. It's done with a website program called DStretch, developed by John Harmon. And when we look at this image, it helps bring out some images. We've got the human figure here and this little figure here next to the human figure, and this might be representing an atlas, what was talked about at the early part of our presentation. These ancient people, the Martyrs, did not have the bow and arrow technology yet, and they did use, as we pointed out, the atlas. So that's, that's a possibility of, of what's being represented here. Bears, obviously, again, bears were a big deal in the world of ancient people. And some bear tracks up in the Sierra. You can see bear footprints walking through the dust. And then this is a drawing that shows some of the many variations of bear paws that were used by Marta's people in their rock art. Here we have a bear paw image here. You can see, you can just see the outline here and the claws. Uh, a lot of images are very faint. These are very old sites. Uh, sometimes you could walk right over them and not even notice petroglyphs, but there's an example of a bear paw image. And if you look at like a field guide, like Peterson's field guide, uh, animal tracks, this is basically what black bear footprints, paw prints would look like. And then we have this particular image, which is at a Marta site. And it's very unusual because it's so exact of a bear paw print. You've got the, the rear, rear part of the paw, the front part, the toes, where the claws would hit the ground. It's unusually accurate, which we imagine might have had some significance to the people that made it. It's so different than your other stylized bear paws that we've been looking at. Again, as to what that meant to the person who made it, we, we can't really tell for sure. We know it represents the bear, but as to exactly what it meant to the uh, Martyrs people, you know, you can only, only surmise. It's uh, only when, you, sometimes when you have a culture like the, with the Hopi, for example, in the Southwest, they can go to a site made by their ancestors, the ancestral Puebloans, uh, what we used to call the Anasazi, and they can look at those images that were made maybe at 800 AD or even earlier, and they can look at them and say, okay, well, that's, yeah, okay, that's where we came out of the center of the earth. That's where the 
deer clan went off on its journey or the fluke clan went in that direction. And there can be some interpretation in that case where you have a contemporary culture that uses the same symbology as their ancestors. But in cases like this, we don't have that opportunity. And even in those cases, you can only get a glimmering of, of the meaning because it could have many other meanings to the people that made it, even though our contemporary culture can have its interpretation of it. Here is an image of a rattlesnake. Um, you've seen a couple of images before of uh, rattlesnakes being utilized in petroglyphs. And here's another one. You can see it has the tail here, as well as you can see the body going through here. Uh, I don't know what happened to the head. Maybe it got cut off. But anyway, um, this is the obviously rattlesnake petroglyph. Um, very long one, too, probably over six feet long. Here's a much smaller petroglyph uh, image of a potential snake or maybe a string. You know, it could be either one of the two of them or even something else. And here is a photograph of a snake as you can see how the body comes like this. And if you go back to the image before, you can see how it goes up and down like that. So that's a good representation of a snake. And you can see on the ground, this is how it would look as a snake goes over a dusty area. Uh, this is an image here with a, a circle on the inside, radiating lines, and a ring on the outside. Uh, it could be a star or something like this. It's hard to say. Um, you, know, you think about what they had out in the, you know, when they're out on the uh, ground, out in the woods, out in the backcountry, what the things they might see that they would represent something like that. Well, maybe an eclipse, maybe a flower. Uh, here's another image one. This one has just the circle inside with the radiating lines. Perhaps Haley's Comet. Well, these images possibly represent maps. We don't know for sure. These are Marta's images. Uh, a little unusual. We don't, don't see images like this very often. Uh, we'll, on this side here, we'll focus on the bottom part of that drawing, which again looks like it could possibly be a map. Will Gortner, who spent 30 summers studying Marta's sites in the Sierra, ended up making this drawing in this picture in the bottom half. He took the image of the petroglyph and then recreated it, uh, drew the river going through the area and dots where petroglyph sites are in the region uh, as a suggestion of one possible interpretation that this might be a map that shows where certain sites are in relation to the river. We, we'll never know for sure, but uh, that's one possibility with this. And I want to mention a, a couple of things about interpretation. And as I mentioned, we can, we can know we're looking at a bear paw, for example, but not know what that actually meant to the person that made it. Uh, sometimes interpreting sites or images can get in the way of other possible interpretations if we get too fixed on our interpretation. So that's something to be cautious about. And there's also, uh, in terms of the nature of rock art itself uh, and, and how that's looked at and interpreted. Uh, these days, in a lot of popular literature, rock art is portrayed as either mostly or entirely made by shamans and being shamanistic. And there have been a number of people who have refuted that view. You know, certainly some rock art is clearly shamanic in nature, but Alana Woody, Agnes Quinlan, Eckhart Malatke, and others have built a good case for other types of rock art as well. Alana Woody and William Cannon have shown examples of rock art at habitation and food processing sites that is not shamanic in nature. So we need to keep an open mind with that. And also there's a little bit of a bias in uh, archaeology in some ways to look at rock art as made by males. Um, we also believe that some rock art was made by women. So we have to also be open-minded in that respect as well. That's the end of our presentation. And we want to offer you some resources to go further. The book Early Rock Art of the American West the Geometric Enigma is just really a wonderful book. 
It's got a lot of good information. It's one of the few books that really relates to the type of abstract art that the Martyrs people made. It also has about 200 photographs of, of beautiful examples of rock art. It could be a coffee table book. But as far as any book that gives you a deeper understanding of the type of, mar of rock art done by the Martyrs, this book would be the one to, to look at. A scientific paper, Emerging Trends in Rock Art Research, Hunter Gatherer Culture, Land and Landscape by Ross. And you can find this with a web search. Um, very excellent paper. Uh, for one thing, she looks at hunter gatherers, what we call hunter gatherers, and points out that these are very intelligent people. They knew so much about their landscape that we can't even imagine. You know, that we're not talking about Fred Flintstone here. These were very smart people. She looks at the role of landscape and also talks a little bit about the bias, gender bias in terms of thinking that just males make rock art. And then the paper style seven rock art and the modest Martis complex. This is the classic paper on style seven rock art by Foster, Betts and Samlin. You can find that with a web search also. So it looks at the nature of style seven rock art and gives examples of different sites that are found in Northern California. And then our website, sarahrockart.com, we have pictures of a number of sites there. We have examples of site etiquette, uh, article on the Martyrs people and other resources as well. Our next presentation, which we're planning to do in late July, have, out, have, have available late July or August. It's called Style 7 Rock Art in Space and Time, the Space-Time Continuum and the Style 7 Universe. It's a very creative presentation that looks at this rock art in the context of space and time. And that's our presentation. We thank you for joining us and thank you for watching this and we hope it's been meaningful for you.